Please turn with me in scriptures to John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. That's on page 901, if you are in a pew Bible. The message today is just an extension of last time. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And as we turn to John chapter 15, please remember that the word, this is the word of the living God, and therefore it is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and is able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So may God read our thoughts this morning as we read his word, and may we be changed by them. John chapter 15, starting in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, your son here tells us that if we abide in him and his words abide in us, that we can ask whatever we wish, and it will be given to us. And so, Lord, out of the abundance of your word here, we pray that you would come and show us your glory. As David said, one thing I ask, one thing I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may gaze upon his beauty and inquire into his temple. God, that's our desire, to see the living God, to see your son, to be transformed. And God, help us to hold on to the hem of your garment until you do that. Please give us a supernatural ability to listen this morning, that our ears and our hearts would be fixed on your word. We ask these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Please be seated. If you're new with us this morning, we're right in the middle of Jesus' farewell discourse before he gets crucified. And so what Jesus is doing is he is preparing his disciples for everything that they will need in life. He's been very methodical in doing this. He spent the entire beginning of this discourse in chapter 14 addressing troubled hearts. And now, as he moves to chapter 15, Jesus is addressing tempted hearts. Tempted hearts. The disciples are going to face a very serious temptation to give up. Judas has already defected. The ruling council of the Jews will very soon have Jesus in their clutches, and the persecution from the world will begin. And so, Defection from Christ will look very attractive to these disciples. And there have been many disciples that have given up on Christ because the cost is so high. And we see this in the New Testament. Paul experienced this in 2 Timothy 4.10. He says, For Demas, was his fellow companion, in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. So this temptation to defect is a very real and powerful temptation. 
you will be tempted with the same thing at one point or another. This will come upon you. And as trials come, as discouragement suffocates you, as apostasy and persecution spread like a plague, and more and more people defect, you will be tempted to give up. So Jesus speaks these words in his farewell discourse in order to prevent that. And he says it very clearly in chapter 16, verse 1. He says, I've spoken these things to you to keep you from falling away. Now, what's interesting about our passage in front of us is Jesus gives us a very interesting medicine. First, so this is his medicine so that you won't fall away. This is what he says. First, he says, you must bear fruit or you'll go to hell. Verse 2 and verse 6, that's the meaning of those verses. How does that help me from defecting? And then in verse 5, he says, oh, and by the way, You're completely helpless to do this on your own. That's Jesus' way of helping you to not defect. See, Jesus does not treat your temptation to give up by reciting some pop psychology Stuart Smalley nonsense to you. You're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you. That's not how Jesus operates. Jesus operates, first of all, by showing you how truly helpless you are. He says in verse 5, if you rely on yourself like Judas said, I'm paraphrasing, you will perish. People do not defect from Jesus Christ because he is not a reliable savior. People defect because they start to rely upon themselves. That's why people defect. They start to, to, to exercise their own strength to rely on their own gifts, to to live for their own purposes. And when they do that, they are so close to defection. That root of self-reliance Jesus is seeking to eradicate. Listen, dear congregation, you are not good enough. You are not smart enough. You are not strong enough. If left to yourselves, you will fail. When Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. He doesn't mean that you can't go to work. He doesn't mean that you can't be with your family. He doesn't mean you can't do those things. He means that those things in and of themselves are enough to damn you to hell because all of our assets are liabilities when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Isaiah 64, 6 said. All of your righteous deeds are as a polluted garment. And that's the first principle of the gospel. You can't do it. Isn't that an interesting way of stopping defection? You're helpless. If you don't embrace that, you'll never see the role that prayer and Scripture play in this passage. That's where Jesus is taking us. If you don't feel the weight of your helplessness, you'll never see the role that prayer and scripture play in your life. Look at verse seven. This is the exact medicine that Jesus gives us. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying you can't do anything, verse five, verse seven, but I can do everything. Call on me. Let my word transform you. Let me change you. Let my word find its home in your heart. Read it, study it, bleed it, hunger and thirst after it, and then call on my name in prayer, and I'll give you whatever you wish, and that will prevent you from defecting, and nothing else will. That's where Jesus is taking us this morning. All of our power comes from his word abiding in us, and all of our provision comes comes from our calling upon him. And this is designed to bring the Father glory and for us to bear much fruit. So here's the two parts for our passage. First, we're going to see the delight of praying from the word. And then secondly, we're going to see the design of praying from the word. So first, the delight of praying from the word And secondly, the design of praying from the word. Here's our big idea. If you're new, our big idea is just what the whole sermon is about. Your helplessness 
brings glory to the Father when you go to Jesus for everything that you need. Your helplessness brings glory to the Father when you go to Jesus for everything that you need. That's what our message is about. So let's go to the Word. First of all, the delight of praying from the Word. If we look at verse 7, notice verse 7 is a conditional if-then statement. The first part is the if, the second part is the then. Verse 7, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, then ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Or if we're going to say it negatively, we would say, if Jesus' words don't abide in you, your prayers will not be effective. Or if we're going to say it relationally, we'd say, your intimate communion with Christ depends upon you knowing his word. Your prayer will have no passion and no power if your heart is not tuned to the frequency of God's word. Evangelicals in our time are so quick to speak about having Jesus in their heart, but we often disconnect Jesus from his word. But Jesus makes no separation here at all. Look at verse four. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. And then look at verse five. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. So in verses four and five, you see this pair together repeated. Abide in me and I in you. And when Christ abides in you like that, you'll produce the fruit that the Father is looking for. And this is the point on which all of verses 1 through 17 rest. You must bear fruit. If there's no fruit in your life, the Father takes away the branch in verse 2, and it burns the branch in verse 6. And therefore, it's paramount that this question be answered at the very beginning. What does it mean to abide in Christ? What does it mean to have Christ abide in us? How can you invite Christ in? This is where verse 7 is so helpful. Instead of saying the same thing again, abide in me and I in you, he changes it. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Notice he changes it from I in you to my words abide in you. And this change helps us to see the practical way in which it means to have Jesus abide in us. Jesus abides in us when his word abides in us. Jesus abides in us when his word abides in us. Jesus and his word are not two separate realities. Jesus is the word made flesh. This is how our gospel began. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So, when the Word of God abides in you, Jesus abides in you. When the Word of God abides in you, Jesus abides in you. And so, it begs a further question How do you let the Word of God abide in you? What does that look like? George Mueller helps answer. This question. George Mueller is most often remembered for his prayer life. He was the 19th century pastor who lived in England, and he preached over 10,000 sermons in his life, but he's best known for the several orphanages that he opened up without ever asking for a dime. He housed some 10,000 orphans in his time, and he prayed every penny to come in because he wanted to show the faithfulness of God in answering prayer. But what you might not know about Mueller was what he considered the most important thing in his life. This is what he said in 1881, quote, I saw that the most important thing I had to do was to give myself to the reading of the word of God and to meditation on it. What is the food of the inner man? Not prayer, but the Word of God. And not the simple reading of the Word of God so that it only passes through our minds just as water runs through a pipe, but considering what we read, pondering over it, and applying it to our 
hearts. Notice the two things that Mueller said. First, he said that it's the word of God, not prayer, that is the food of the inner man. And this is huge. Mueller is not downplaying the importance of prayer at all. No one in the 19th century, I would venture to say, had a greater prayer life than George Mueller. But his point is that prayer and everything else must start with the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You won't, you won't even have enough faith to pray. What are you going to pray? What are you going to pray if you don't have the word? Do you realize that our prayer lives are so ineffective because we don't have the word in us? Secondly, Mueller said, he, he, rather he pointed to the type of attention to the word that is required. This is what he said. It's not a simple reading of the word of God so that it only passes through our minds just as water runs through a pipe, but considering what we read, pondering over it, and applying it to our hearts. Dear congregation, this is how branches relate to the vine. The sap flows through every extremity, to every twig, to every leaf. The branch is not a pipe for sap to run through. It's a sponge. The branch soaks in every vitamin, every nutrient, every DNA strand. And that sap, that living word, is what creates life. If the branch acted like a pipe, the branch would die. And, and how often do you read the word of God where the word of God is just flowing through you and you can get up five minutes later, what you read? I don't know. That's not abiding in the word. Dear congregation, this is how we're to take in the word of God. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That word dwell in the Greek is and okeo, and it means to inhabit you, to influence you, to reside within you. It's the same word that the Apostle Paul uses in 2 Timothy 1.14. He says, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Jesus is saying, let my word abide in you and dwell in you just as the Holy Spirit does. Many Christians are so spiritually impoverished today because they treat the word of God like a fortune cookie. They crack it open to whatever page and they read part of the scripture and they, they go on their way thinking that that's enough for their food. That's not how you treat anything else in life. In fact, George Whitfield fought against this in his day. There was a movement called the Moravians who simply opened up their Bible and pointed at random to the first verse that they came to. And they, they acted like that was guidance from God. And this is treating God like a superstition. That's not how you let Christ's word abide in you. Mueller says this again, quote, These, the scriptures, are the God-appointed means for your nourishment. Consider them, ponder them especially that you would read regularly through the scriptures consecutively and not pick out here or there a chapter. If you do that, you will remain spiritual dwarfs. You'll remain spiritual dwarfs. The words of scripture are not musings of old dead men. They're not pieces of sage advice or stories of heroic valor. The words of scripture are the very thoughts of the living God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Dear congregation, when you read the Bible, the Bible reads you. It reads all of your fears. It reads all of the secrets of your heart. And it displays to you who you really are and who Christ really is. And if you don't look at that, you will not produce fruit. And therefore, when Jesus tells us in verse 7, let my words abide in you, this is what he means. He means do whatever it takes to continue to listen to my voice. My voice is found in the scriptures. Meditate on it. Interrogate it. 
Let, it, let me shape you through it. Let me convict you and comfort you through it. Let my word reign over every other word in your life. So that's the first part of verse 7. That's the if part. The way that we abide in Christ is we let Christ's word abide in us. And if that happens, then the then part on verse 7 is what is produced. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And when I read statements like that, it's hard for me to take them in without taking considerable pause. Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. What does Jesus mean here? Well, consider again our overall context. Jesus says this right after he laid down two massive truths. Truth number one, unless you bear fruit, you'll perish. That's verse six. Truth number two, apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse five. And so what should we pray for in light of those two truths? Jesus, produce fruit in me because I can't live without you. We know that Jesus had fruit bearing primarily in mind because of what he says in verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. When John says by this at the beginning of verse 8, he's connecting you're praying in verse 7 to God's glory and his giving in verse 8. In other words, the Father is glorified when we pray for fruit, and he's glorified when he gives it to us. And we know that's what Jesus has in mind when he says, whatever you ask, I will give to you, because there's another clue in verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So follow Jesus' logic. I've chosen you, I've appointed you to bear fruit, so that, that's the purpose clause, when you pray for fruit, when you pray for supplies, the Father will provide it. What's prayer for? It's for fruit bearing. It's for fruit bearing. Jesus chose us to bear fruit in the world, and when you pray for that, he promises to give it to you. Prayer only breaks down when we pray wrongly. So James says in chapter 4, verse 3, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own desires. Therefore, since it's clear what we're supposed to pray for, fruit which God willing we'll look at next week, does that nullify what Jesus says in verse 7? If we're supposed to pray for fruit, does that mean, therefore, that we really shouldn't pray for whatever we wish? Because that's what verse 7 says, whatever you wish. Here's, here's the truth. When the words of Jesus abide in you, you will have universe-shifting desires. You will have universe-shifting desires desires. Your problem, dear congregation, is not that you have grander desires than God has. Your problem is that your desires are far too small. You pray for small things. Jesus wants us to pray for grand things, for universe shifting things, for Christ exalting things, for soul transforming things. Imagine for a moment, if your spouse is dying, how should you pray for them in light of verse 7? George Mueller faced this problem twice. His first wife, Mary Groves, whom he was married to for 39 years, died when he was 64. His second wife, Susanna Sanger, whom he was married to for 23 years, died when he was 90. He preached at both of their funerals. When Mary, his first wife, was struck with rheumatic fever, Mueller's heart was close to being broken. How did George pray for her? How would you pray? He prayed that she would be healed, 
but on this one condition. <laughs> Lord, I'm going to give you conditions to heal my wife. That's what he did because he understood this verse. He prayed for her to be healed on the condition that it would be good for both Mary and for him and that the father would be glorified and that he would be satisfied. That was his condition. And his prayer was rooted in Psalm 84, 11. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That was the center. That truth abided in his heart and it created a orbit around everything that existed in his life and it focused his prayers even for the health of his wife. And so this is what he said after the fact. If it is really good for me, my darling wife will be raised again, sick as she is. God will restore her again. But if she's not restored again, then it would not be a good thing for me. And so my heart was at rest. I was satisfied with God. And all this springs, as I have often said before, from taking God at his word, believing what he says. End quote. Mary died with that fever. And Mueller had deep sorrow over her death, but he was able to thank God for enabling him to rest satisfied in God's dealings. For Mueller, the second half of John 15, 7 absolutely came true. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. He received exactly what he prayed for. His deepest and most profound desire was that whatever the vine desser thought was best, that he would be satisfied. And that's what happened. God, you think that my wife leaving me is what's best for me. I trust you. Help me to be satisfied in that. How do you get there? How do you get to that place where Mueller was? Let Christ's word abide in you. Let it shape your desires. Let it shape your prayers. Mueller could pray like that and live like that because Psalm 37, 4 had become a reality to him. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's not a throwaway line. That's biblical Christianity. And, and therefore he was able to subordinate his prayers even for his wife's health to whatever God thought best. And he knew down deep down in the deepest part of his soul, that because of Jesus Christ, no good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly. So he received it as a good thing. When you pray from the fullness of God's word dwelling within you, you will get everything that you ask for. Because your prayer life will be set on fire to ask for the biggest things. You'll pray things like, Lord, do whatever it takes to help me find all my joy in you. Lord, do whatever it takes to sanctify me. Lord, Lord, do whatever it takes for me to love your people and spread your gospel. Lord, do whatever it takes for your church to bear fruit. If heartbreak will cause your name to be exalted, then I trust you, Lord. That's what Job prayed. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Those are the prayers that Jesus says he will absolutely answer. Don't throw out verses like this because prosperity gospel preachers have abused them. That's their problem. Embrace these verses. Trust that if you take God at his word, he will give you whatever you wish when your prayers align with his revealed truth in scripture. He will grant those things to you. Let's look at the design now of praying from the word. The design of praying from the word. Let's look at verse 8. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So recall our context here. 
You must bear fruit or you'll perish. Verse 6, apart from me, you cannot do that. Verse 5, therefore, verse 7, pray from the fullness of my word abiding in you, and you'll be given everything that you need. And now verse 8, by this, my Father is glorified. Do you see the design? Our helplessness highlights God's honor. Our paralysis parades God's praise. When we come to God with all of our needs, he gets all the glory. This is what John Piper says. He gives us a very helpful analogy. He says this, quote, suppose you are totally paralyzed and you can do nothing for yourself but talk. And suppose a strong and reliable friend promised to live with you and do whatever you needed to be done. How could you glorify your friend if a stranger came to see you? Would you glorify him by trying to get out of bed and carry him? No. You would say, friend, please come, lift me up. And would you put a pillow behind me so that I can look at my guest? And would you please put my glasses on for me? And so your visitor would learn from your requests that you are helpless, but your friend is strong and faithful. You glorify your friend by needing him, by asking him for help, and by counting on him. That's how God is glorified in our prayers. We pray because of the reality of verse 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Prayer is the confession of that. Prayer says, God, I am weak, but you are wealthy. God, I am poor, but you are powerful. No goodness dwells in me, but you are goodness itself. I am insufficient, but you are all sufficient. I am foolish, but you are faithful. Prayer glorifies the Father because it says, I am needy and you are the only need provider. The giver gets the glory. What a foolish notion it is to to refuse to pray because we need something. That's the only time we should pray because you're needy all the time. You need to praise God. Your soul needs to say, I love you, Jesus. Your soul needs to say, I need you, Jesus. Your soul needs to see the glory of the Father and rejoice that he is everything that you could ever want or wish or desire or long for. That's what your soul needs more than anything else. I can imagine at this point, somebody might say something like, well, is there any room for praying for earthly things? Can't I pray for lost keys? Can't I pray for skinned knees and for marriages to hold together or for my finances or for my health or for my relationships to be restored? Is it okay to pray for those things? Yes. Jesus says, Matthew 6, 11, Pray for your daily bread. And we see lots of examples of this in Scripture. Church prayed for a multitude of different things. In Acts 12, 5, they prayed for Peter's release from prison. Jacob prayed to the Lord that he would be rescued from his brother Esau in Genesis 32. Nehemiah prayed when he was standing before the king to know how to answer King Artaxerxes. So it's right to pray for earthly things. You ought to pray for earthly things. But all of these things must be subordinated to one thing, namely the Father's glory. Father's glory is the single, dominant, all-defining explanation for every event under the sun. And we've seen this throughout John's gospel. The Father's glory was the reason the man was born blind in Genesis 9-3. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And dear congregation, if you're sick, if you're dying, this should be such encouragement for you. I'm sick right now. So that God's great glory could be seen in my life. My sickness has a meaning And the meaning is to display that Jesus is more worthy than my health. I'm going to hang on to him. Father's glory was the reason that Lazarus died. John 11 verse 4. This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. So that the Son of God might be glorified through it. The Father's glory was the reason that Peter was martyred the way he was. Church tradition says that he was crucified upside down. 
Jesus predicted it, John 21, 19. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And the glory of God was the reason that Jesus went to the cross. John 17, 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Therefore, yes, pray for earthly things. Pray for earthly things much of the time, but chiefly pray that no matter what God decides to do, whether he decides to restore your health or no, whether he decides to restore your marriage or no, whether he decides to rescue that relationship or no, that he would be honored and that you would rest satisfied in him and he will answer that prayer. And if you think that's a second prize, you don't know what the glory of Christ is. That's the ultimate prize. That's the fruit that God is aiming at. And Jesus wants to make sure that we get this. He he refuses to leave us here. He refuses for us to walk away from verse 8, thinking that you have to sacrifice your joy on the altar of God's glory. God's glory and our joy are not to be separated things. Look at verse 11. These things, means everything he just said. These things I've spoken to you so that, you're, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. When we subordinate our desires to God's glory, we are not sacrificing a greater joy for a lesser joy. When the Father exalts himself in our life, that is the greater joy. That's why Mueller could preach at his wife's funeral. This is what he said. As his wife's lying in the coffin, the Lord is good and doeth good. All will be according to his own blessed character. Nothing but that which is good like himself can proceed from him. If he pleases to take my dearest wife, it will be good like himself. What I have to do as his child is to be satisfied with what my father does that I may glorify him. That's the type of fruit that proves we are Jesus' disciples. That's how verse 8 ends. By this my father is glorified that you may bear fruit and so prove to be my disciple. When you abide in Christ, When his word abides in you, when you pray and produce fruit that glorifies the Father, you are not earning a spot on the vine. Jesus is not saying, do all these things so you can show me that you're worthy enough to be part of my kingdom. Paul said, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. You're not earning anything. You're proving something. You're proving, you're proving that when Jesus spoke the word to you in verse 3, you came alive. Already you are clean because of the word I spoke to you. You are proving in real time the truth of verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Why do you bear fruit? Because Jesus, from the beginning of time, said, bear fruit, and you're bearing it. And when that happens, you're proving, you're proving a work that's already been done. You're not earning. And that's how the Father is glorified. You bear much fruit in spite of verse 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Why? Because Christ's word abides in you and you prayerfully depend upon him for your every need. So let's apply this to our lives. Here in our application, we look at doctrine, duty, and delight. So we apply this to our mind, that's our doctrine, to our will, that's our duty, and then to our hearts, which is our delight. So first of all, our doctrine. Failure to pray is always a sign of self-reliance. Failure to pray is always a sign of self-reliance. It's not a sign of self-reliance some of the time. 
It's always a sign of self-reliance. It's always a sign of self-dependence. It's always a sign of self-righteousness. And this is the absolute implication of Jesus' words. He tells us to ask whatever we wish. Why does Jesus tell us that? Because apart from it, you can do nothing. He tells us to pray. He tells you to pray because you are helpless on your own. And so if you don't pray, what you're telling Jesus is, no, Jesus, I got this. I can handle this on my own. I'm not as helpless as you make me out to be. Prayerlessness is not merely a mishandling of priorities, it's pride. Prayerlessness is one of the chief signs of the reprobate. David said in Psalm 14:4, Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the name of the Lord? Why do the reprobate refuse to pray? Because they see no need of the Lord. If you say, dear congregation, I'm too busy to pray, I just don't have time, then you're agreeing with everything that I'm saying. You're saying, I have too many things to do that require my effort. I have too many things to do that are dependent on me. If I give time to prayer, I'm giving less time to the things that I must do. Puritan Thomas Brooks said this, quote, What are all of your businesses that are upon your hands compared to those businesses and weighty affairs that were laid upon the hands of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and Daniel and Elijah and Nehemiah and Peter and Cornelius? What are your businesses compared to those? And yet, all of these exercise themselves in private prayers. Now, certainly, sirs, your great businesses are little more than zeros compared with theirs. If you're too busy to pray, that is all the more reason to pray and ask God for help. Nobody was more busy than Jesus Christ when he ministered on the earth. He held the universe in his hands, and he was looking forward to the cross. And what did he do? He often retreated to private mountaintops on his own, and he prayed all night. Jesus was not self-reliant. He depended upon time conversing with the Father, and so do you. Dear congregation, the quickest way to give into the temptation to defect and to give up is to start to rely on your own strength. Having your prayer life consist merely of throwing up 10-second prayers to God is like texting while you're driving. You're going to crash. That's not going to work. And you feel it in your bones. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. So that's our doctrine. Failure to pray is always a sign of self-reliance. So here's our duty. Get yourself happy in the, word, in the Lord through his word. Get yourself happy in the Lord through his word. Mueller insisted upon the importance of John 15, 7. Remember what he said. He said, quote, I, I saw that the most important thing that I had to do was to give myself to the reading of the word of God and to meditation on it. What is the food for the inner man? Not prayer, but the word of God. The first thing to be concerned about was not how much may I serve the Lord, not how much may I glorify the Lord, but how I might get my soul into a happy state and how my inner man might be nourished. See, Mueller was a Christian hedonist. He believed that as he pursued his enjoyment fully in God, that God was maximally glorified. He understood that truth. What does this look like for us? How how do we get ourselves happy in the Lord through his word? Well, consider three ways. Number one, memorize the word. Memorize the word. Psalmist said in Psalm 119.11, I've stored 
up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. That Hebrew word for stored there can be translated treasure. Memorizing is treasuring. It's placing words in your heart that won't, you, you won't let go of, that you can pull up whenever you need to pull out your sword out of the scabbard when the enemy is attacking you. You have it because you've stored it. If someone offered you a combination to a safety deposit box which contained millions of dollars and you had to memorize the code to get into it, would you memorize the code? How much more precious is the word of God? What's going to sustain you when the world is crumbling out from underneath your feet? Money? The word of God, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's what will sustain you, not your bank account. Memorizing is not a trivial exercise. Memorizing is treasuring. It's treasuring. Secondly, meditate on the word. Meditate on the word. This is implied in verse 7. If my words abide in you, in no ko in the Greek, meaning let my word inhabit you, influence you, reside in you, There's a powerful effect what happens when you meditate on the word of God. When you mentally chew on the words of Christ. David tells us this in Psalm 39.3. He says, my heart became hot within me as I mused, as I meditated on your word, the fire burned. When we reflect on God's word, when we mentally chew it up, your heart will, will leap on fire. Thirdly, pray the word. Pray the word. This is where many Christians fail. They treat the word of God like a a pipe. Words go through. You're a pipe and the words go through and just fall out the other end. If that's what you struggle with, then consider reading and prayer. Put them together. Listen, if you were to ask which is more important, reading or prayer, it'd be like asking what is more important the right wing of the plane or the left wing of the plane when you're 30,000 feet up. They're both important. You take away one and you die. So God gives us scripture so that we can enter into a holy argument with him. And that's how you should use scripture. Lord, your word says, delight myself in the Lord and you will give me the desires of my heart. And so, Lord, help me to conform my, all of my desires to your desires. And your word says that this is the confidence that we have towards you, that when we pray according to your will, you hear me. So, Lord, this is your will. Delight yourself in the Lord. Lord, I want to delight myself in you. Answer that prayer and believe God at his word. Cause me to see, O oh God, that whatever comes from your sovereign hand, it's only good. You can only do good things. What if you woke up every morning with that confidence? God, you will only do good things for me. You will only do good things for me. That is not the prosperity gospel. Because we define good things in a very radically different way. You will only do good things to me. You will only conform me to the image of your son. You will only sanctify me. Reading and memorizing and meditating on the Bible is the central act of Christian existence. If you're looking for a resource on how to do this, John Piper recently released a brand new book called Reading the Bible Supernaturally. I would recommend it to everybody. Super good book. So that's our duty. Get yourself happy in the Lord through his word. Here's our delight. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. When Mueller later recounted the last moments of his wife, Mary, this is what he said. Quote, the last portion of scripture which I read to my precious wife was this. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Now, 
If we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, we have received grace. We are partakers of grace, and to all such he will give glory also. I said to myself with regard to the latter part, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I am in myself a poor, worthless sinner, but I have been saved by the blood of Christ. Dear congregation, God does not withhold any good thing from those who have trusted in him. He has given you his only son. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He has given you his son. How will he fail in giving you anything else? And I mean afflictions. And I mean trials. And I mean hardships. Because the word says, count it all joy when you face various trials. Because that's the testing of your faith. And the testing of faith will prove, produce steadfastness. And stead, let steadfastness have its full effect. So that you will be perfect and lacking in nothing. So when your wife dies. Or when your health fails. Or when your bank account is zero. Trust that even these things are good things. Ultimately from the Father. They will be ultimately used to draw you closer to Jesus. Ultimately closer to the cross. And ultimately closer to glory. That's his promise to you. And he sealed it in the blood of Christ. Let's pray. Father, help us to take you at your word. Help us, Lord, as Mueller believed, Lord, that no good thing does he withhold those who walk uprightly, God, and we are not upright in ourselves. We are crooked sticks, but you have made us upright in Christ. You have given us his record of righteousness. And you have placed our sins upon his back and you raised him from the dead for our justification. And he sits at the right hand of you, O oh God, where he makes continual intercession for us. And so, God, we know that everything that comes from your hand is only good. Help us to rest satisfied in that and help us to produce fruit that you might be glorified. We ask these things in the name of your precious son. Amen. Please stand with us.